can I drink alcohol if I suffer from gout? And we start right now. Hi guys, I am Dr. Pete. I am a PhD biochemist and a certified health coach. In 2016, I was diagnosed with gout. And then later in 2019, I was diagnosed with prediabetes. I've been on the ketogenic diet for three years. I reversed my diabetes and I put my gout in remission. Chronic alcohol consumption can lead to the gout condition in the first place. And secondly, drinking an alcoholic beverage in itself can initiate a gout flare. In this presentation, we are going to assume that you've had one drink and that drink is going to be composed of number one, pure alcohol in it and then some kind of mixer. We have to consider the alcohol as a mixed drink. Now, what do I mean by mixed drink? Just to clarify, we could be talking about a glass of wine, for example. That qualifies here because in the wine you have the alcohol component and then you have the other stuff. We could be talking about beer. This is a similar thing. There's going to be the alcohol component and then there's going to be the stuff that's mixed with the alcohol. Similarly, we could be in a bar and ordering a type of drink that has some kind of mixture in it, like a gin and tonic, for example. So we'd be talking about, or we are going to talk about the pure alcohol component on that and then the stuff that's coming with it. Remember, the overarching relationship here that we need to understand from the basis of science is how we get from the alcohol and the stuff that's been mixed with it to uric acid. And there is no way to talk about that without dealing with the biochemistry. So you take a drink. What happens next? 20% of the alcohol in the drink is going to be metabolized by the stomach, intestines, the muscle, and kidney. A full-on 80% of the ethanol, which is the alcoholic component of the drink, arrives at the liver and then enters with no regulatory controls. Once the alcohol or the ethanol is in the liver, 100% of it is going to be metabolized from the ethanol to the acetate as is shown in this first slide. There are two questions that need to be asked about this slide. First, what happens to the NADHs that you can see are being produced there? There are two of them. And then secondly, what happens to the acetate? Because remember what our goal is. Our goal is to understand how we get from the ethanol to uric acid. This is the question. First, we must deal with the acetate. In this slide, you can see that the acetate is converted in two steps into a molecule that is called acetyl-CoA. This transformation can happen outside the mitochondria or it can happen inside the mitochondria. It makes no difference. The thing to pay attention to is that that transformation, acetate to acetyl-CoA, requires the breakdown of metabolic money, ATP, into AMP. And then, this is the very first place where, where we need to address the fact that the AMP is changed chemically, it's deaminated, and the end result of that is the formation of uric acid. So this is place number one, where the ingestion of alcohol leads directly to the production of uric acid. And we have learned that you need the presence of uric acid to have a gout flare. So this is point number one, after eating alcohol, where we produce uric acid. In this next example, it's super important for you to understand that when uric acid is produced in a cell, it's going to be, some of it's going to be transferred out of the cell into the blood supply. And that uric acid, which is in the blood supply, can be excreted by the kidneys. So this slide is showing the second way that we produce your high levels of uric acid in the blood. The key thing is look at the right side of the presentation there and you will see the transformation once again from ethanol to acetate. And I want to draw your attention to the NADHs because now we're gonna talk about the NADH. So the NADH that's produced drives another biochemical reaction. 
the transformation of pyruvate to lactate. Lactate is an organic acid, which then, when it reaches our blood supply, is excreted by the kidneys. The problem is that the lactate blocks the excretion of uric acid. So therefore, the uric acid rises in our blood. Wine, beer, and mixed drinks can contain sugar or high fructose corn syrup. The major ingredient of both sugar and high fructose corn syrup is fructose, and the metabolism of fructose produces directly uric acid. Once fructose reaches the liver, it enters the liver in an unregulated fashion. 100% of the fructose that is ingested reaches the liver. As you can see in the slide, once the fructose is inside the liver, it is going to be phosphorylated. That means we're going to take a phosphate and attach it to the fructose. In order to do that, we're going to utilize a molecule of ATP. And in the slide, you can see the ATP is converted to AMP, which is short for adenosine monophosphate. The issue is, is that once we generate the AMP, it's going to be degraded through a series of steps to produce uric acid. So this is the third place where we have produced uric acid when you have had an alcoholic drink. The fourth place where we get the production of uric acid comes from ingesting alcoholic drinks that have been fermented with yeast. The yeast are an issue because they are single-celled animal cells. And in those cells, they contain DNA and RNA. And DNA and RNA, when this is broken down, when you eat them and you digest the yeast, when we break the DNA and the RNA down, we produce purines. And when the purines are degraded, which is shown in this slide, you can see that we produce uric acid. So to summarize, when you drink an alcoholic drink, you produce uric acid four distinct ways. First, by the conversion of acetate to acetyl-CoA. That's number one. Number two, the formation of lactate, which prevents or blocks the excretion of uric acid from the kidneys. Three, the metabolism of fructose. And the fourth, the breakdown of purines. So what are the effects of elevated uric acid in the liver? On the slide, you can see that there's five things. First and foremost, we have the reactive oxygen species, right? Free radicals that get generated that damage the mitochondria. We have the formation of fatty liver, which can lead to the third thing, which is insulin resistance. Then we have inflammation. And then lastly, the rising uric acid impairs endothelial function. Remember what I've taught you about gout flares. The question being, what do we need to have coming together in order to have a gout flare? Well, number one, you've got to have uric acid. We've talked about this before. It's obvious, right? If the uric acid is not there to crystallize, then there will not be a gout flare. But in addition, we also need systemic inflammation. And we also need formation of the NLRP3 inflammasome. On my last slide, I summarize a potential plan to put your gout in remission. Number one, stop drinking alcohol. Number two, put a stop to the sugar and high fructose corn syrups. Number three, stop eating processed food. Number four, monitor your UA, your uric acid, using a uric acid meter. Number five, consider going on the medication allopurinol. And number six, think about going into the keto lifestyle or the low carb lifestyle. I'd like to thank you for watching. If you enjoyed this presentation, if you learned something, please click the subscribe button and hit the bell next to it so you know when the next time is that we're publishing a video.